Well, many of you know, if you know me, that um, years ago I began collecting nativities, and uh, I really enjoy them, and it got kind of obsessive. So a few years ago, when after Doug and I downsized, um, I put them all out the first year, and I was like, oh my goodness, I have so many, they can't even fit in this house anymore. So if you came to my house during that the Christmas season and looked at my nativities, uh, and you said you liked one, I probably gave it to you, unless it was uh, somewhere, you know, from around the world that I've been. And I don't know why I co started collecting them, but I've just really enjoyed through the years just looking at the, the manger scenes and looking at baby Jesus and also looking out some, some places to pick them wrongly, and they've got the wise men there. I was like, wait a minute, that happened later. So um, anyway, but but it's interesting because I think that during Christmas often we – focus more on the Christ child than the reason for which Christ came. And uh, we think of Jesus as the baby in the manger instead of the Jesus on the cross that came to save us from our sins. Um, if Jesus were still in that manger bed, then you and I would have no need to study his word, right? Christ did not come as a baby in a manger to remain a baby in a manger, but quite the opposite. He came as a baby so he could grow up and be a man and eventually die on the cross for our sins, to take away our sins. And for those of us who have repented of our sins and turned our life over to his lordship, uh, we live very differently from those who have never Return, repented and turned their life over to his lordship. And so John is going to contrast these two different types of people in our text, and he puts it like this if you'll look in 1 John 3, 4 to 8. Notice what John writes. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. But he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, our outline for this lesson, we're going to look at three things. First of all, the reasons Christ came, we're going to see two reasons for that Christ came. Also, the results for those who are his, the results for those who are his, we'll see two results. And then the results for those who are not his, the results for those who are not his, and there's two results of that as well. Now, a couple of weeks ago when we were together, we were considering how should we live in view of the Lord's return, and we saw three ways that we are to live in view of our Lord's coming. First of all, we're to abide in him. We remain in him. We don't go in and out of salvation. Uh, we remain attached to the vine, as Jesus says in John 15. We also saw that we're to practice righteousness. In other words, we just do what's right. You go through your day, and you just do the right thing, and we do that because he's righteous. And thirdly, we saw that we purify purify ourselves in light of his return. He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So we continue on that, that road of sanctification and growing into Christ's likeness. We also answered the question last time, why should we live like this? Why should we live like this in view of the Lord's return? And we saw, first of all, so that when he comes, we'll have confidence. When he comes, we won't be ashamed at his coming. We won't shrink when he comes. That was the second thing reason. And then thirdly, we saw that we want to do that so that we will be like him. And then fourthly, we're going to see him as he is. And we saw the Greek there means uh, with wide, wide, eyes wide open. And we're going to see Christ as he is. And what a time that's going to be. And so John has just reminded them of the importance of striving for purity in light of the Lord's return in verse 3. And just in case they don't get it, he reminds them of the danger they are in if they continually commit sin, if they continually practice sin, if they do not purify themselves as he is pure. And so we're going to begin, first of all, with our first result of those who do not belong to the Lord, do not belong to the Lord. John says in verse 4, whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. Now, notice that John begins with the word he's used many, many times, whoever. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying whoever? Because, ladies, it's universal. It doesn't matter. 
You can claim to be a Christian, but if you practice sin, you're not of the Lord. It can be a pastor, a pastor's wife. It can be a youth director. It can be someone that sings on the worship team. Uh, it can be someone who runs the sound booth. It doesn't matter. Whoever, there's no exception. And so he says, whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. Now, what does it mean to commit sin? Well, commit here is in the tense, which means to continually practice sin. Sin is the pattern of this person's life. It actually reads this in the Greek. Whosoever is continually doing sin is doing lawlessness. Now, we have to ask the question, what is sin? Since we don't want to continually do it, what is it? Well, sin is really anything that offends the Lord. It's an offense against his righteous standard. Um, it also, and you've probably heard this term before, it means to miss a goal, um, like an archer. Uh, the Dankers aren't here this morning, but uh, many of them like to use bow and arrows, and especially Jaylee. And so, you know, I've never done, a, I don't even know if I've ever used a bow and arrow, but I understand, you know, you pull it back and you hope to hit what? That middle target. But if you miss the middle target, you've missed what? You've missed the goal of what you wanted to do. That's what, that's the Greek word here. Uh, also, it would refer to a traveler uh, who misses his destination. And, you know, for those of us who have our GPSs, uh, I call them soon touchies because they, many times they'll say, you've arrived at your destination. And I'm like, this is not my destination. I don't know where you've taken me, but it's not my destination. So it would refer to that. So a traveler who's traveling, but they miss the place that they are supposed to go. And so John says, whoever commits sin is practicing lawlessness. Ladies, sin is missing the mark, the standard, the mark that God has set for us in his word. And this is not just the Ten Commandments. This is talking of the whole of scripture. Every sin that we commit is sin. Now, there's two types of sinning. Sins of commission, you might say, what is that? Things that you know that are wrong. You know that it's wrong to commit adultery. You know it's wrong to steal. You know it's wrong to lie. Those are sins of commission. But there are also sins of omission. Sins of omission. Uh, that would be things that you don't know yet that are sin. But ladies, we're still held culpable for that. And that's why it's imperative that we be in the scriptures so that we can know what God said is sin. Paul says we have the mind of Christ, but ladies, the only way we're going to have the mind of Christ is to know what Christ says in his word about sin. And so anything is sin that is against God's holy law. Now you might say, well, Susan, that's not fair. I mean, that's not really fair. What if, what if I'm doing something that I don't know is sin? I really don't know that it's a sin. Well, Paul tells us in Romans, we do know. <laughs> Romans 2.15, he says this. He's talking about those that never even hear the gospel. He says, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts either accusing or excusing one another. Uh, Paul says what? The law is written in our hearts. And ladies, we know this is a promise of the new covenant according to Ezekiel 36. God writes his law in our heart. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I'm going to take your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways and you will keep my statues. So God says, I'll put a new spirit within you. I put a new heart within you. We know right from wrong, right? We know right from wrong. The problem is not knowing what is sin. The problem is determining not to sin, right? We know what is sin. So John says, if you continually practice sin, you're committing lawlessness. You're violating the law. Now you might say, why? Why? Well, John says, because sin is lawlessness. What does that mean? To commit sin is breaking the law. Now, John is not talking here about someone who says, I know there's a law and I choose to break it. 
but he's talking about someone who lives their life as if there is no law. There is no law at all. This reminds me of the book of Judges, where at the end it says, and everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And ladies, we're living in a culture today that acts as if there is no law. There are no laws, and I can do whatever I want. I can violate every law of the land. Nobody's going to tell me what to do, <laughs> and I'm going to do what I want to do. There is no law. That's what John is saying. If you continually live your life saying, eh, I know there's over 600 commands in this guidebook, but I'm not going to yield to any of them. I'm going to live my life as if there is no law. Ladies, John says if you live your life like that, then you are committing transgression, committing lawlessness. Now, John is attacking the heresy of his day, Gnosticism. We were talking before we started this morning about all the new, not just uh, Word of Faith, but the NAR and the ARK. And I mean, every day there's a new one on the horizon, right? More and more crazy her heretics out there. And they're just like what was going on in John's day. We've talked about Gnosticism. The Gnostics, remember, they taught and lived that you could be involved in sin as well as be indifferent to any acts of sin, anything done in your body, and you could still know God. You could do whatever you wanted in your body. You could commit adultery. You could kill. You could steal. And the Gnostics would say, you're not responsible. Why? Because the body is matter. It's evil. Therefore, you're not responsible for the deeds that are done in your body. And John is saying that is ludicrous. That is ludicrous. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. So the first result for those who do not belong to God, they're sinners, ongoing sinners. They're lawbreakers. Well, John reminds his readers that Christ came to take away our sins, not to have us become engrossed in sin. Look at verse 5. And you know he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. John says, you know this. This is not something that's new to you. Christ was manifested. He appeared. That's what the word means. He appeared. He came to earth. He was in heaven, but he came to earth, uh, born of a virgin. He was a baby in the manger, but he left that manger, and he grew up and became a man and died on the cross for our sins. So why did he come? Why was he manifested? John says, to take away our sins. Ladies, this is the first reason Christ came, to take away our sins, to take away our sins. Now, what does it mean to have our sins taken away? Well, the word actually means in the Greek that our sins are lifted up and carried away. <laughs> They're lifted up and carried away. I like in the Old Testament when, you know, the priest would lay his hands on the goat and confess the sins of the nation, and then that goat would run away, and he would never be seen anymore. Why? It was, a, it was an analogy of Christ coming to take away our sins. As the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Remember the account of Joseph when the angel appeared to him in a dream in Matthew 1.20, and he said, fear not to take Mary as your wife. And he went on to say, you know, she's going to, the virgin will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Why? For he will take away what? His people's sins. He's going to take away the people's sins. And also remember when John meets him for the first time, uh, he says what? Behold the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sins of the world. Ladies, Christ came not to stay in that manger, but to take away our sins. And I don't know if you've ever thought about all the sins you've ever committed and that you still commit. Even today, you've probably committed a few, right? Uh, if not in word, in your heart and in your mind. But, you know, all that's been forgiven. All our wretched, filthy sins have been lifted up and taken away. And there is only one person who can do this, to take away our sins, the spotless lamb. Why? John says why. Because in him there is no sin. That's why he can take away our sins. In fact, literally it reads like this. In him sin is not. Ladies, God is, has been forever in eternity past and in eternity future. He is forever without sin. He is sinless. He is pure. He is holy. In fact, the verb tense here suggests that Christ was sinless in the past, in the present, and in the future. I want to be very clear. Christ has never sinned, is not sinning now, and he will never sin, right? He will never sin. 
Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he has made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, right? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, John just made mention in verse 3 that he is pure and solely makes sense that he has no sin. Remember the Gnostics taught Jesus did sin. And ladies, we have false teachers today. I heard one recently uh, that even said that uh, Jesus looked at, you know, would look at porn. And uh, if he was alive today, in him is no sin. Don't listen to the false teachers of our day that say that Jesus sinned. He did not sin. They taught Jesus was material and that he sinned. They denied that Jesus was the Christ. Well, because Christ is sinless, in him is no sin. Because he came into the world to take away our sins, then it only makes sense that those who know him will not sin habitually. So John now gives us the first result for those who belong to the Lord. Notice what he says in verse 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. Ladies, here again, John points us to the fact that whoever, it's universal, just like the whoever in verse 4, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever remains permanently in him does not sin. Remember, no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. And ladies, I would say if you observe a person's life and they're living in habitual sin and they are not convicted by their sin, you have to go back to what scripture says. No one can pluck them out of the Father's hand. Those who practice sin are not of God. Ladies, John says very clearly, whoever abides in him has a continual relationship with God. They're in the habit of doing the will of God. They do not sin. Now, you might be thinking, well, John must be crazy. I mean, you know, John's 100 years old. Maybe he's got Alzheimer's. He must be crazy. There is no way I cannot sin, Susan. I've already sinned today. How can this be? How can a Christian not sin? Well, some well-meaning people have taken this to mean that Christians never, ever, ever sin. They call it the doctrine of perfection. I don't know if you've heard of that. I remember my friend Maggie Roller telling me, I think I shared this uh, this last year in one of my teachings. Uh, she was teaching a, a pastor here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, actually, uh, giving him a golf lesson, and uh, he tried to convince my friend Maggie that he had no sin, that he doesn't sin anymore. And uh, I would have loved to have been a little mouse on the golf course and heard what she told him, because I can only imagine what she told him. But uh, I would have probably said, could I talk to your wife and see what she says if you never sin? But there are people in our day and age that teach that and actually believe that they never commit any sin. Ladies, that's, that's heresy. We do sin. Even Paul, in his converted state, he's talking about warring about the sin in his life, and he says, I want, I want to do what's right. I want to do what's right, but I don't do the right thing. I end up doing the bad thing. The good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I hate, that I loathe, I end up doing. And he comes to the end of Romans 7, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from the body of this sin? Who's going to help me? And uh, so, ladies, we all do. We war against sin. Even Moses. Uh, Moses was the meekest man in all the world. And what did God say about him? Uh, besides that he was the meekest man in all the world, he said, What? You're not going to get to go into the promised land. Right. Because he told him what? To speak to the rock and what did he do? He struck the rock. He got angry. So he forfeited his right to go into the promised land. He sinned. He got angry. Uh, David, David, who was a man after God's own heart, David sinned. He committed many sins, right? Committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband murdered on the front lines of battle to cover up his sin, and on and on it went. But ladies, David was not a habitual sinner. But, there, but we sin. I'm saying all this to say we sin. Even John, who wrote this epistle, uh, we have a recorded sin of his in Scripture. Remember when he and James were uh, with Jesus and they were getting ready to go into uh, the village of Samaria and the Samaritans didn't want Jesus to come there. And, and so James and John, who wrote this epistle, uh, said, Master, why don't you just call fire down from heaven and blast these Samaritans out of their existence? Just kill them, Lord. <laughs> kill them. And Jesus said, you do not know what manner of people you are. I didn't come to destroy the world, but to save it. So even John, 
sinned. John was not sinless. So what is John saying? In fact, we've already seen if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, 1 John 1, 9. So what is John saying when he says that those who know God do not sin? What's he talking about? He's talking about a habit of sin, that continual sin that we just looked at in verse 4. John is saying, if you abide in the Lord, if you are a true Christian, you do not carry your past ongoing sin into your new life. Sinful patterns do not characterize someone who is in a relationship with Christ. Ladies, sin is interrupted. An unbroken state of sinful behavior from the past into the present, which continues in the present, characterize the children of the devil, but not one who has been begotten of God. You know, before I became a believer, when I uh, was at the age of 30, uh, 36 years now, I've been a Christian, uh, the things that I was involved in were horrific. Um, and, you know, I didn't carry those sins into my new life. Uh, those things that I used to do, I, I loathe, I hate. Uh, do I sin? Yes, I sin. But that, that, those patterns of sin in my life before I became a Christian, that's not who I am today, and nor should it be anyone else who claims the name of Christ. So, ladies, this is the first result of those who know God. They do not practice sin. They do not practice sin. A person who claims to be a Christian and yet has an ongoing pattern of sin in their life proves to be a spurious Christian. My husband used to call them a believing unbeliever. <laughs> they don't have a regenerated heart. Ladies, if there's no change towards Christ's likeness, then we need to examine ourselves, right? We grow from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I like what I think Howard Hendrick used to say. The Christian life is three steps forward, two steps back. Three steps forward, two steps back. But we're progressing, right? We're not degressing. We're progressing towards Christ's likeness. Or John would say this person is of the devil, as we'll see in our next lesson. One man said this, the believer may fall into sin, but he'll not walk in it. Christostom said, to sin is human, but to preserve in sin is not human, but altogether satanic. Now, I want to give you an example of this. I just mentioned Moses. He got angry, didn't, go get, didn't get to go into the promised land. But when you look at Mo if when you think of Moses right now in your mind, do you say, oh, yeah, Moses was a man full of anger? No. You look at all the other passages, and he put up with those grumbling Israelites, and, you know, he was the meekest man in all the world. He went before Pharaoh ten times uh, because God told him to. So when you think of Moses, you don't think of an angry man. David did commit adultery. He did commit the act of murder. But when you look at the rest of David's life, would you say D David was an adulterer? No. We don't have any other accounts of David committing adultery. He did not continue. In fact, in, in Psalm 51, he confesses that sin against thee and the only have I sinned. I've done this evil in your sight. And so he repented of that. So ladies, Paul makes it clear in, in two different places in the New Testament, those who think they can live a pattern of sin and be a believer are dead wrong. In fact, you want, if you want to turn to these two passages, that's great. If not, if you just want to listen to them, that's fine. Um, these often I will use in the counseling room, these two passages right here, uh, when I'm counseling a woman or discipling a woman who has ongoing patterns of sin that are not interrupted. I mean, they're, they're just continuing to, to sin in a certain area. And I usually hand them my Bible, and I say, would you read these passages, please? And uh, very speaking the truth in love. And uh, so they read them, and they'll say, what does God say about your sin? Hmm, I'm not going to heaven. I'm like, you're right, so we need to, you know, repent and, and start doing the right thing. The first one that Paul mentions is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he says this, don't be deceived about this. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, and extortions will inherit the kingdom of God. But I love this. And such were some of you. But now you're washed, you're clean, you're sanctified. Ladies, that describes us before Christ, right? We were all those things. Not Well, maybe not all, but a lot of us were some of those things. But that's who we used to be. The other passage is Galatians 5, 19 to 21. 
Paul says something very similar. The works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, and the like, of which he says this, I've told you before, and I'm telling you again, it's like a mother to a child. I've told you before, and I'm going to tell you again. But Paul says this, those who, and here's the word, same word John is using, if you practice these things, you don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. Paul is not saying you, you occasionally do one of these things, but he's talking about a life, a practiced life of adultery, fornication, hatred, someone who has outbursts of wrath all the time, envy, murder, someone who's a drunkard. All these things, if you practice, he says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, back to 1 John. John goes on to say, whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. Now, what does this mean they've not seen him? They're not talking about visually, visibly seeing Christ. But the word means to experience or to discern clearly. John's not talking about physical vision. He's talking about spiritual vision. They haven't seen him. They don't know him. Remember, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe. Also, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Ladies, why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you believe in Jesus? God's opened your blind eyes, right? He opened your blind eyes to see who Christ is is but John says if you practice sin not only can you not see him not only are you spiritually blind but he says it proves that you have not known him or come to know him he says John says if you continue to sin then you don't know him you don't know him you have never come to have an experiential knowledge of Christ and again John is refuting the heretics of his day who said what i know god (laughs) hey i know god i don't keep his commandments hey i know god but i hate you (laughs) and john is confronting this heresy and ladies we have it today in our world as well they were saying that they had superior knowledge they were in the know and john says nope you have not come to know him you have not come to know him you practice sin every day you say it doesn't matter what you do in your body and john says no You have not come to know him. How could you come to know him if you live in habitual sin? Ladies, that's contrary to the new nature. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews gives us a a warning, a fearful warning. If you hold to this view, in fact, the Gnostics should have read this verse, but this should be something that we should think about. He says, if we have sinned willfully, if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, There remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking, an expectation of fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Well, John continues to warn them just in case they think they can sin and be in a relationship with God. He says in verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Little born ones of God, don't let these heretics deceive you about this. Let no one succeed in deceiving you. Let no one cause you to roam or be led astray about this. Again, he's talking about the false teachers of his day. Don't let them harm you. Don't let them say it's okay for you to sin. It's not okay. John says, my little children, don't let anyone deceive you. John says, the real test for whether you know God is this. Notice what he says. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Now, ladies, notice very carefully. John does not say we become righteous as we practice righteousness. Otherwise, our salvation would be what? Our works, right? And it's not by works which we do. John is saying, listen very carefully, doing righteousness, doing the right thing, is a sign that we are what? We're righteous, Ladies, right now, if you know the Lord, do you know, do you know that God looks as you as righteous as if you have never sinned? That's an amazing, amazing truth that I hope you bank on. John is saying doing the right thing is a sign that you're righteous. It's a sign that you belong to the Lord. 
In fact, Jesus says a very similar thing in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 17. He said, every good tree brings forth good fruit. And a bad tree brings forth what? Bad fruit. Ladies, a good tree doesn't bring forth bad fruit. Neither does a bad tree bring forth good fruit. That's what John is saying here. If you are a daughter of the king, you're going to be righteous just as he is righteous. This is the second result of those who know God. They practice righteousness. They practice righteousness. Well, just in case it's still not clear to the readers and just in case it's still not clear to some of us, John says that to continue in sin not only proves you're not born of God, but it proves you're of the child of the devil. Notice what he says. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. John says if you continually practice sin, if you continually commit adultery, if you continually get drunk, if you continually do one of the many things that are mentioned in Scripture that we're not to do, you're of the devil. Now, what is the devil? Well, we know what he is, right? The Greek word is diab diabolus, which means a cross or to cast. His Hebrew name is Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the slanderer. He's also called in Scripture the evil one, the wicked one, an enemy, a murderer, a liar, Beelzebub, the prince, a deceiver, the prince of the ruler of this world. Uh, he's the fallen angel that we read about in Isaiah 14. And John has already mentioned the devil. If you recall in chapter 2, verse 13, remember he refers to him as the wicked one. And when we come to the end of 1 John, he's going to tell us that the whole world lies under the influence of Satan. <laughs> Why would we want to be a part of the world, right? The whole world lies under the influence of Satan. Ladies, Satan is certainly someone I would not want to be identified with. And yet those who continually practice sin are identified with Satan. It was interesting when we were at the Truth Matters conference last week and uh, we were watching Justin Peters' presentation and he was, uh, as he does, shows some of the false teachers of our day and what they're teaching. And I remember, you know, looking at some of these these people, and I made mention to, I don't know, the people that were with me, they actually look like the devil. Of course, we know false teachers are energized by Satan. And some of their eyes and their, their looks, they look like Satan. And ladies, I, I don't want to be identified with him, but false teachers we know are energized by the evil one. But John says if we continually practice sin, we also are a child of of the devil. That's why John said in verse 6, those who abide in him don't do that. The pattern of sin has been broken. And John goes on to say the devil sinned from the beginning. Now, the question might come to your mind, the beginning of what? The beginning of the world, the beginning, what is he talking about? Well, some hold that it is the beginning uh, when he came as a serpent to Eve and tempted her, that he sinned from that beginning. Others hold to Isaiah 14 when it says, How are you fallen, O son of Lucifer? Uh, when Satan decided to, he wanted to be like God, and he rebelled and he fell and took uh, several angels with him, the fallen angels. And so some believe that that's the beginning when he sinned. But another possibility that we'll see in our next lesson is the beginning when he's talking about uh, Cain uh, murdering his brother. And uh, it really goes right along with what John says in uh, John 8, 44, you're of the father the devil, and the desires of your father you'll do. He was a murderer from the beginning, talking about when he energized Cain to murder his brother. And we'll talk about that in the next lesson. So I don't know for sure what it means from the beginning. It could have been uh, Isaiah 14. It could, believe when, it could be when he entered uh, into uh, tempted Eve, and that was when sin began, and he was uh, a sin from the beginning, or it could be what we'll talk about in our next lesson. I wouldn't uh, stand on a battle and fight you for that, but we do know he sinned from the beginning, right? So from the beginning of one of those three, three things. Ladies, he, it's amazing because he was perfect. He was one of the most beautiful creatures that God created. In fact, Ezekiel 28, 15 says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Satan was perfect in his ways from the day he was created, but Ezekiel goes on to say, till iniquity was found in you. Till you said what? I want to be like God. <laughs> I want to overthrow God. I'll ascend to heaven. I'll exalt my throne. Ladies, that behooves us. Uh, we better be careful with that attitude in our heart, right? Uh, where we think we can come against a most holy God like Satan did.
Well, this is the second result of those who do not know God. They're of the devil. <laughs> they're of the devil. And so John goes on to state another purpose for which Christ came. We've already seen the first reason he came was to take away our sins. But now John gives us another reason why Christ came. He says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the second reason Christ came was to destroy the works of the devil, to dissolve them, to render them inoperative, to nullify them, to deprive Satan of his power. Ladies, Christ came to undo Satan's evil works, to free us from the awful consequences of our sin. The works of the devil are everything that he is behind. And Jesus came to destroy them, to destroy them. In fact, Jesus himself said it in the beginning of his earthly ministry in Luke 4.18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Those who are oppressed by the evil one. They're in bondage. They're blind. They're bruised. They're brokenhearted. Uh, in fact, even remember when Jesus sent the 12 out to go and do the work, he said, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, uh, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Uh, and these were the marching orders he gave to his 12 disciples. Even the Apostle Paul was given marching orders from Christ to do the same. In Acts 26, 18, he says, I'm sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they will receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Ladies, Christ came not as a baby to stay in that manger, but to take away our sins and to destroy the works of the devil. And I can't wait for that day that he's finally cast into the pit of hell and all his little cohorts with him. And uh, that's going to be a glorious day when he's cast into the lake of fire. The battle's going to be over. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm ready for that. The battle of my sin will be over and Satan will be defeated. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. So in summary, what are the reasons Christ came? to take away our sins and destroy the works of the devil. What are the results for those who are his who believe in him? They do not practice sin, but they practice righteousness. And what are the results for those that are not his? They sin, they practice sin, and they're of the devil. They practice sin, and they're of the devil. Ladies, which camp do you fall in? I know some of us want a third camp. There, there ain't no third camp. There's two camps. You're either a child of the devil or a child of the Lord. And, you know, it's really not a hard question to answer. Is your life characterized by doing what's right, by fighting hard against sin? Have you seen change and growth in your walk since you've believed in Christ? If you hate sin, if you're convicted when you sin, if you confess your sin, if you determine to turn away from it, more likely you're a daughter of the king. If you continually practice sin, if you have no conviction when you break God's law, if you behave as if there is no law, if you've seen no change in your life since you've become a Christian, then I would say you have not come to know him. You have not come to know him. But ladies, it doesn't end there. You can come to know him. You can come to know him. And there's no time like today. I met a man this, this last week at Truth Matters, and he came up to me, and he said, Are you Susan Heck? I said, I am. And he said, My wife was so transformed by your teaching. He said, I was so, sh just the change in her. And he said, I just want you to know, I repented and gave my life to the Lord, watching her life change. Uh, and he thought he was a Christian, but he had watched his life and he, wife, and he said, She's a queen, and I'm down here. But he said, I repented and gave my life to the Lord. Ladies, he saw change in her, but he knew he wasn't changing. He knew something was wrong. If there's no change in your life since Christ, then there is no salvation. But ladies, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you can be saved. You can be saved. Believe he is the Christ and confess him as Lord. That means you're not in charge of your life anymore. He's the boss. You're not. 
and you do what he says. And by the way, we're going to see in a little while, not this lesson, but in the future lesson, that his commands are not a burden. They're not irksome. They're not weighty. They're a joy. They are a delight. It's my deepest desire and prayer that all who are listening will come to know the joy of having your sins forgiven. Ladies, it's a wonderful thing to come to know him, isn't it? And to no longer be under the influence of the evil one. Will you, if you have not already, come to know him? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. These are just very simple verses, really. Uh, we're either, either a child of the devil or a child of the king. There is no in-between. I thank you for John. I thank you for this portion of scripture. I pray for those who may not have come to know you, Lord, that they will come to know you. Thank you again for the destroy, destroying the works of the devil, and one day he will be finally destroyed. And thank you, Lord, for saving us. We are so indeed blessed by your gracious hand. In Christ's name, amen. 